namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Today I would like to talk about different uh, modes, levels of consciousness. The chitta, the pure awareness, is not really uh, complicated. It's just the pure knowing. But the experience of it is uh, various. Every, every person during the course of a day, the course of a 24-hour period experiences at least three quite different modes of consciousness. There's the waking consciousness, there's dreaming consciousness, and there's deep sleep. And all these are quite different. A deep sleep is a continuous immersion in what's called the Bawanga. This is a term from Abhidhamma. Uh, Bawanga is uh, best understood as the mind idling in neutral. Let's say, you know, it's not engaged with anything, but it's not the same as, it's not the total unconsciousness. We generally don't remember our experience of Bawanga. And in the course of a day, in our waking life, uh, we have a tendency to slip in and out of Bawanga. The mind idles in Bawanga until it takes an object. And the more awake and alert and clear you are, the less your mind slips back into Bawanga. But if you're tired or um, your consciousness is dull for some reason, you're, you'll be in and out of Bawanga a lot and you won't really grasp the objects and you'll be muddled. Also, according to Abhidhamma, uh, Bawanga is, in, in a sense, it's a, uh, it works as a, um, a link between lifetimes because the uh, quality of your Bawanga, the um, uh, nature of the, the state of Bawanga, which varies from individual to individual, is set by the last moments of your previous life. At that time, you, the mind takes a, a, a sign, a nimitta, some kind of an image, and that becomes imprinted in the mind, and in the next life, that's the Bawanga object. But normally, we don't retrieve um, that. We're not, we, we don't, because the Bawanga is such a low level of consciousness, we don't normally recall the Bawanga state. You know? And then when the mind takes an object, it's said that the Bawanga vibrates, and this is all from Abhidhamma, the Bawanga vibrates at the presence of an object and it goes and takes the object and then it leaves Bawanga and consciousness is then taking object through one of the senses, which includes the mind sense, which is aware of mental objects, or the five physical senses, which are aware of external objects. Uh, and in our um, ordinary waking life, this uh, consciousness, which is uh, called vijnana, as it operates through the senses, this vijnana is intimately uh, involved with the, another per, uh, aggregate, the aggregate of perception or sanya. They work so closely together it's really uh, nearly impossible to 
experientially separate them. Not entirely. Sometimes in um, if you're very quick and sharp in, in meditation, you can distinguish. But it, it's difficult, and normally we don't distinguish them at all. They just happen you know, as a pair. Consciousness takes an object as raw data like eye consciousness perceives colors and shapes ear consciousness perceives amplitude and frequency and perception then takes that information and basically creates the image that you uh, experience So you're not conscious, Vijnana is not conscious of a, of a specific external object, like if there's an apple on the table, Vijnana just knows color red and round shape, and the uh, Sanya then identifies that as an apple. And the, the operation of Sanya is very complex and it's um, also educable. Uh, if uh, you're looking at the apple and um, you know about varieties of apples, you could say, well, that's a Macintosh, that's a Red Delicious, whatever. Um, that's, that's also a, a faculty of, um, of Sanya, which works with memory and is trained and to be more, more precise. Sanya is also Uh, somewhat uh, unreliable at times because um, it has a creative aspect. We're basically creating a simulation of the external world based on uh, inputs from the senses. And the world we actually experience is not, we don't experience the outer world directly, we only experience our own mind the, the uh, I imitation or simulation of the world that our mind creates for us. And you can see a, a good example of um, how Sanya works with some optical illusions and how the um, the, the raw data is then parsed by the workings of perception into uh, something else. You know, there's one uh, one optical illusion that has um, a pattern of uh, of of dots, and there'll be a uh, one dot missing from the pattern. And if you look right at that spot, you'll see it. You'll see, oh, there's a dot missing. But if you're looking at the other side of the picture, your mind fills in the missing dot. There's also a number of optical illusions that, depending how you look at it, it's one thing or another. There's, um, like, the, the probably the most uh, well-known one is the two faces in a vase, right? The one, you know, the dark background can be seen as two faces or the white foreground can be seen as a vase. Uh, there's a number of ones like that, some of them quite clever. And perception flips back and forth between the two interpretations. And this simulation that we live in is uh, uh, accurate enough, you know, it's, it's realistic enough that we're able to function in the world, but it's not actually the world, it's our own mental reconstruction of the world. And for different species of animals, they have uh, different uh, sensory apparatus. Uh, they live in quite different perceptual worlds. Imagine a bat that's you know, almost blind and navigates by echolocation. You know, their world that they live in is quite different than, than our world. And there are insects that can 
and birds as well that can perceive colors that we can't perceive that are beyond the the uh, ultraviolet spectrum so they see additional colors that we can't we can't even really imagine what they are so the same process of uh, creating a, a imaginary uh, or imaginative reconstruction also occurs in dreaming but the difference here is that in the waking life the construction of the mind is uh, tightly bound to the incoming information from the senses you know most of the time and assuming we're uh, um, we're not insane, you know, we're not hallucinating. We're, we're perceiving information from the senses and then parsing it with perception. But in a dreaming state, you're not getting external information. You're working only with, you know, fragments of imagination and memory, and the mind creates an entirely illusory world. The Buddha said about dreaming, there's different kinds of dreams. He said that some dreams are memories of the past or visions of the past, meaning past lives. Some dreams are visions of the future. Some are messages from the Dewas. And some are just wind in the belly. You know, that's probably the great majority of our dreams. It's just kind of in mind just spinning nonsense. But there is possibility in that state of dreaming to have uh, to get some deep meaning that it can occur that there's some connection to past, future, or even uh, messages from Dewas. So these are the three, you know, standard <coughs> modes of consciousness. But that doesn't limit. The, the possibilities. Uh, in the uh, Abhidhamma analysis of consciousness, there's a discussion of four levels of consciousness, or bhumis, or planes, or levels. The uh, uh, base level uh, is uh, the uh, kama bhumi, uh, the level of sensuality, which is the ordinary default mode of consciousness for human beings. It's also the uh, most complicated or complex or differentiated, which means it's also the most bewildering and confusing. And then we get lost in it. And it has a very wide range the um, range of beings that uh, operate in this level includes everything from the, the lowest hell realms up to the, the, the uh, six sensual heavens. And it includes, as well as humans, it includes ghosts and uh, animals. operation of consciousness in the Kama Bhumi is centered around the, the senses. We take our information through the senses and even our thoughts, our desires, our uh, fears, they all revolve around sense objects. That's the default mode of existence for animals and humans and uh, sensual dewas. In the dewa realms, I think the operation of a perception, we could say, is somewhere between our ordinary waking state and the dreaming state. It's, it's more fluid. Reality is more fluid for the dewas. 
and this is, reaches an extreme in the case of the Dewas of the fifth heaven, the uh, Nimanarati Dewas. These are the Dewas who delight in creation. Uh, they have complete control over the, their perception. Their external reality is created by them as they wish. You know, if they wish to, you know, the, you know, they don't have to. They don't have to uh, build a house. They just imagine it and create it with their mind. And um, whatever they they wish for, they they create with their mind. So the reality for them is entirely fluid. But it's still operation of consciousness and perception. There's an interesting uh, passage by uh, Zen Master Dogen in his um, Rivers and Mountains Sutra. It's a very interesting text uh, where he uh, attributes the difference between the different realms of existence entirely to perception. And he, he gives the example of a river to a human being, it's clear, clear flowing water. <coughs> to a, a being in the hell realm, it's molten lava. To a, a naga, it's a realm of crystal palaces. You know, so the same external uh, base reality, which we never really ever touch, is experienced radically different by different classes of beings to the extent where according to Dogen at least it's a defining characteristic separating the different realms now we can train our uh, our consciousness which is the purpose of meditation And we generally talk about two types or modes of meditation, both of which have their virtues and their uses and their value. And you know, for balanced practice, they should have some some uh, practice of both. That's uh, samatha and vipassana. In a samatha meditation, we're training the mind in stillness or stability. This is the, the, the meaning of the word samadhi, that the mind is unmoved. So we take an arbitrary object like the breath and fill the mind with, the, with that object to the exclusion of everything else. And this type of meditation leads to a, a unity of mind, ekagata, a unification of mind, which culminates in the states we call jhanas. And I'll have a bit more to say about that. But uh, uh, first I want to distinguish the types of meditation. The other type, vipassana, means clear seeing. Uh, this is a training the, the consciousness to be uh, clearly aware of momentary occurrences without coloring them. You know, so it's, uh, in a sense, it's really um, disciplining or limiting the role of perception so that, that the raw data is experienced moment by moment. So this leads to a clarity of understanding. <clears throat> We're trying not to color the experience by our uh, beliefs, our, our desires, our fears, but just what is this object right now immediately arising in consciousness? So returning to the concept of the four levels of consciousness, uh, Samatha meditation, as I said, leads into jhana. And that 
experience of jhana is actually a phase shift of consciousness. It's now in the second level of four, which is uh, called the uh, the uh, rupa bhumi, or the realm of form. And it's called that to distinguish it from the third level, which is arupa bhumi, the realm of the formless, or the level of the formless. Now, each of these levels, the these two levels, have um, can be distinguished as an attainment or as an existence. And that's a distinguish. That's a distinguishing uh, category that's um, recognized in Abhidhamma. As a as an attainment, it means that a human being in the uh, uh, Kama Bhumi has practiced meditation and has attained that level of consciousness and is experiencing it. As an existence, it means that someone is reborn into a level of being that has that mode of consciousness as the default. You know? And in the case of the realm of form, that means the Brahmas, the Brahma gods. The Brahma gods are well beyond the level of the Devas. The Devas are closer to us in experience than they are to the Brahmas. There's a great gulf between the Devas and the Brahmas. The Brahmas are beyond the realm of sense uh, experience. They, they have only the functional senses of sight and hearing and they don't have any desire for sense objects. They have a des they're not perfect. They, they can have defilements of false view and pride and the desire for being, the desire for, for mastery, but they don't, they don't desire sense objects. They don't eat in the ordinary way. They feed on bliss, internally generated sukha and piti. So they, um, and they don't, they don't have uh, genders, they're not distinguished as male and female, all, they're all just classified as, as beings. No. Uh, the separation into genders is a characteristic of the Kama Bhumi level. Beyond that it doesn't apply. So this is an analog to the state of experience of a human being who's in jhana that they are beyond at that time you know while they're in jhana they're they're beyond the desire for sense objects and their mind is is uh, unified the there are four jhanas and there's four levels in the brahma world corresponding the Brahmas of the second level are called the Abhasara Brahmas. They're beyond thought conception. So thought conception doesn't occur in second jhana and it doesn't occur for the Abhasara Brahmas. Their, their main experience is uh, rapturous happiness, which, which we call piti. Third level, Subhakina, they experience bliss. And the difference between this is piti and sukha, rapture and bliss. The difference with bliss is that uh, it's a calm, oceanic kind of happiness. Whereas there's a thrilling aspect to piti. There, uh, there is not in uh, in sukha. There's no physical reaction in with. Uh, Piti, there's a, there's a physical component that the, the meditator can experience spine rushes or tingles, goosebumps, many sorts of things like that. But this is uh, not present with sukha. The only bodily expression is a complete sense of ease and well-being in the body, but uh, no no movement. And this is uh, distinguished in the the Brahma gods with their radiance. All the Brahma gods are radiant. 
uh, the Abbasara beings, their radiance is said to uh, flicker like a torch. And the Subakina Brahmas, their radiance is said to be steady like the full moon. So you can see the obvious metaphor. Then the fourth level is equanimity. The, uh, the Brahmas of the great fruit, they experience, they're beyond bliss. They just experience this profound, peaceful existence. We can see um, an example of um, the, the characteristics of the Brahmas and the characteristics of the Jhanas in, the, uh, in that all the, any stories that we have in the, the texts, in the commentaries, or the suttas, or the, the jatakas that involve Brahmas, they're, they're always first level Brahmas. Because the, at the first level, there's still thought conception and speech. So they can actually interact with other beings and do stuff in the world. Whereas the higher Brahmas are just blissed out all the time, so they don't make any stories. <laughs> just, they're just... <laughs> just chilling out in their realm. Um, then there's another phase shift of consciousness going beyond uh, the realm of form into the realm of the formless, which is uh, mind only. There's no body. There's no materiality. So they, they, that's dropped away. So you'll notice, and this is another point that's important to grasp, is that as we move up through the levels of consciousness, we're uh, seeing a purification and a simplification. It's not that there's anything added. You know, it's not like there's something uh, esoteric and exotic that's being added to consciousness. It's levels are being stripped away and a more basic primordial kind of consciousness is there all the time is it, uh, but, it's, but it's hidden like the blue sky is hidden by the clouds so that the higher levels of consciousness are just simpler they're more they're less cluttered and going through the, the realms of the, the formless there's also four levels here There, that's also a continuation of this theme of simplification. The, f the first realm is the realm of boundless space, which still has that kind of very tenuous link to the physical because space is a concept bound to the physical, but empty space is that we don't really relate to it as an object. <coughs> but boundless space, and all that exists is consciousness aware of boundless space, then in the second level, space drops away, and one is aware only of boundless consciousness. It has been suggested that this level, boundless consciousness without reference to space, is what was perceived by the, uh, the writers of the Upanishads when they talked about the uh, Atman equals Brahma that they were experiencing this uh, unity of consciousness. Then the, uh, the third level is, the, is even consciousness is, is not, one's not even aware of consciousness, it's, it's the realm of nothingness. And then the most subtle level is the level of neither perception nor non-perception, when even the concept of nothingness drops away. Even nothingness seems too, too cluttered, too complex, too busy. So when that falls away, what's left is neither perception nor non-perception, <coughs> <coughs> which is just a name to uh, try and grasp what's really uh, indescribable. But it's still, even this most subtle level, we're still within samsaric existence this is still a conditioned existence and everything within samsara is impermanent is imperfect and is is uh, without self-substance 
but we could say this highest level or deepest level neither perception or non-perception is samsara at its bare minimum it's the bare ghost of samsara but it's still one more gulf to cross one more big divide and that's in the the level that's uh, nibbana the unconditioned which is entirely outside of conditioned phenomena, has no relation to it, and it's not even really classified as a bumi. It's just outside of the uh, the system altogether. And it's not really possible to say anything definitive about it because our words and our concepts are conditioned and we can't grasp the unconditioned with the conditioned you can't put a net around the banner you can't describe it in, in words one of the uh, metaphors the Buddha uses speaking about the banner is uh, a light beam, a sunlight, like you have a beam of sunlight coming through a window in a house and it strikes the far wall. But then if you knock the wall down, where does the sunbeam strike? Hmm? So Nibbana is the uh, complete liberation from the condition. It uh, has nothing to do with, with conditionality or, or any of our categories of existence or non-existence, being or non-being, none of these apply. And following this theme of um, purification and simplification, we could say that it's the ultimate uh, purification. One is purified of all conditioned existence and purified of non-existence as well. Generally, when we talk about and think about these uh, levels of consciousness, and if and you'll see, if you see them in in a book, then they make a a diagram. They usually show it like a vertical hierarchy with sense desire realm at the bottom, and then form and formless in the bana. I think I think a uh, probably a better way to visualize it is like a bullseye of concentric circles with nibbana at the center and then formless around that and the realm of form and then on the outside the widest circle that of the sense desire realm and these circles can be subdivided in different subdivisions of the different realms and the further you move out from the center the more complicated the more differentiated, the more uh, bewildering the experience is. And so you, you're lost, you know, we're out in the uh, sense-desire realm, your beings are spun around, driven by the, the winds of uh, the mind, driven by uh, fear and fascination, you know, desire and aversion. It's pull hither and thither you know, without and uh, it's very confusing and bewildering and we we purify and simplify then we drop away whole layers of stuff so you know using this bullseye analogy if you enter jhana you've like shed temporarily an entire level of samsara you haven't escape samsara but you've simplified it there's less of it to deal with you've dropped the whole level away and uh, this uh, way of looking at it as purification and simplification is the, is the most skillful way to approach meditation and spiritual progress Rather than thinking of gaining something or going somewhere, you know, there's nothing to gain and nowhere to go. We're trying to lose stuff, drop things away, and experience a more natural and primordial state of mind. 
um, mythologically, the uh, story in the Aganya Sutta, which is very fascinating and has a lots of lots of really interesting aspects to it, um, is the story of the beginning of this world system. There's no ultimate creation in Buddhism; as time is beginningless. But this particular world had a beginning and will have an end. And the beings that became human, according to this story, were originally Abhisara Brahmas, second level Brahmas, who uh, were circling the earth, feeding on bliss, radiant, you know, living a Brahma existence. And then they, they fell from that level when they started to engage in the sense world. And the particular thing that happened was they became curious about uh, the foam on the surface of the sea. There was, as the world congealed and became more solid, foam appeared on the surface of the sea that had a n nutritious aspect. It's compared in the commentary, compares it to the, the skin on boiled milk. And they uh, they tasted it with the tip of their finger. And as soon as they did that, they took on a coarse body and fell to earth. Uh, and they, it's, a, it's a long sutta with a lot of detail. And they go through several stages of basically devolution, becoming rougher and coarser and grosser until they turned into the sorry specimens we know today. <laughs> but this, uh, the, this mythological aspect if you think about it, it, it means that um, the, this is the primordial aspect of jhana, that when we're entering jhana, we're just remembering a state that we lost long ago. We're not creating something new. No? <clears throat> so in summary, now we have all these different levels of consciousness and different modes and different uh, activities that we can do to, you know, uh, experience different levels of consciousness. Um, but they, we should always be striving for a, a greater clarity, uh, like more wakefulness, spending uh, spending less, fewer mind moments in in Bawanga, you know, being more awake and clear. And we should be attempting to, to simplify and purify, to remove the clutter and the, um, the complexity and try and get back to a basic, uh, basic underlying natural primordial uh, nature of mind. Andamayam dama kataya sadhu garanda dama se sadhu 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 anumodhami.